Hello there, stoned commander. I don't think that the questions you've asked in your video are actually that difficult to answer at all, so I'm going to have a go. First off, your video is titled Evolution Questions, but you start off asking about the Big Bang. Well, evolution is not the same as the Big Bang. They're both scientific theories, but they describe very different things, in the same way that the description of a rose doesn't describe a baseball. You also have to open your mind to new ideas, starting off with the phrase, all this science shit suggests that perhaps you've already made up your mind, which would obviate the offering of any explanation. So on to the Big Bang. You're actually pretty close in calling the start of the Big Bang a massive piece of whatever, although it wasn't rock. It was an incredibly dense concentration of all of the matter and energy in the universe packed into an extremely small space, the primeval atom, if you will. Something else to clarify is that the Big Bang Theory didn't create galaxies and such. The Big Bang Theory describes the Big Bang. This is in exactly the same way that a biology book explains life but isn't actually alive. As Desert File has said on numerous occasions, the Big Bang Theory describes what we're seeing in the universe today. It doesn't describe the creation of matter and energy, only how, on a cosmological scale, everything appears to be racing away from everything else. And so, if you extrapolate back in time, everything must have been much closer together in the past. Continue back far enough, and it must have been extremely close. That's the beginning of the Big Bang. Now on to the roundness of planets. Um, the roundness of planets is actually very easy to explain. Um, to be more accurate, planets are really spherical, not round, because they're three-dimensional objects. You give the example of blowing up a bowling ball with a stick of dynamite in it and say that the pieces would not be round. Um, this is true for the bowling ball because the scale of the material you're working with. In the bowling ball, the mechanical strength of the material that makes up the bowling ball is stronger than the gravitational forces that try to pull the bowling ball pieces back into a sphere. Let me give you an example. Take a small piece of paper and hold it in one hand. The paper has enough rigidity to be able to support itself over this small distance with this small mass. A larger sheet of the same kind of paper cannot support itself and it's the same principle with the rocks that planets are made from. A stone the size of your fist is rigid enough to maintain its shape. A stone the size of the earth is massive enough for gravitational forces to overcome that rigidity and deform the rock. Every atom in the rock will seek the lowest point of potential energy, and so the natural shape for the planet is a sphere, where the surface is equidistant from the centre at all points. In the next part, you do start to talk about evolution. You give the example of deer jumping in front of a car headlights. Well, the motor car has been around for just over a hundred years or so, and that's not really long enough for deer to evolve a survival mechanism to deal with cars. So you are quite correct, it does take time. I think that it's very unlikely that annoying little fish were the evolutionary driver for the shape of the hammerhead shark's hammerhead. It's more likely that the shape of the head provides lift, and therefore helps it to swim, much like the aerofoil shape of an aeroplane wing provides lift for the plane. These sharks also have electrical sensors that help them to detect prey. The hammer shape of the head spreads these sensors out over a wider area. It's directly analogous to having a larger TV antenna or satellite dish. You get better reception, and so does the shark. The formation of tornadoes is actually very well understood. Um, tornadoes are atmospheric vortices. They're formed when rapidly rotating column of air makes contact with the ground and the climbed layer above. Explaining what they are is easy, and there's plenty of information readily available in both textbooks and on the internet. It's predicting them. That's the tricky part. I don't think that your evaluation of so-called first-generation atheists is valid. You say that Christians, Muslims and Jews are all better than atheists because at least you believe in something. Why would believing in a god make anyone better than somebody else? 
do you think that somebody who believes in fairies in the woods is better than somebody who doesn't believe in those fairies? Because, you know, at least they believe in something. What about belief in voodoo or Satanism? Your view that younger people consider themselves to be better than their parents is not entirely true. It would be more accurate to say that each generation is probably better educated and more knowledgeable than its predecessors, simply because the sum total of human knowledge increases with time. It's not about being intrinsically better, it's really about the amount of knowledge that's available. Years ago it was taught in astronomy that the craters on the moon were volcanic. Knowledge has advanced, and we now know that they have formed from impacts. It was once thought that the sound barrier was unbreakable, and we now have supersonic jet aircraft. Once people used gods to explain the heavens, explaining the workings of the world. More and more people are finding that they no longer need these explanations that there are more logical explanations for the presence appearing under the Christmas tree than the idea of Santa Claus on his supersonic reindeer sled. That there are more logical explanations for the origins of the universe and life on this planet and even morality than a set of fairy tales handed down through history from a tribe of desert nomads. So it's not that we think we're better than our parents, it's just that thanks to them we start off in a better place. Isaac Newton said that he could see further because he stood on the shoulders of giants. The same is true for us today. We can see further than ever before because we're standing on the shoulders of giants who are taller than ever before. And from up here, to many of us, your God looks rather small.